at its sea level rise, particularly east flooding, there is rising temperature. See what I mean? They are all interlinked. When the globe is warming, the Antarctica, the North Pole, begins to melt. Ice sheets melt and end up in the same ocean as well. They come down this way, sea level rise. Before you know it, that beach is overflowing and all that. They are all linked up. Individuals, whether collectively or um, but two governments, all hands must be on deck. It's not a big job and it's not easy to address. But we should start from somewhere. In Nigeria, we see a lot of things we don't do it. Mm. If only we could implement even one third of environmental laws we have, there would be no problem. I, I think changing our way of life to sustainable living would be the best approach, whereby we also, on the other hand, try to grow our carbon sinks. Now, for some areas, uh, maybe like clean cooking, for example, we can ensure that we, we entrench sustainable cooking. Keeping in mind, not everybody can transition to LPG. But what you can now do for the rural communities is you ensure that they utilize biogas, which is just the utilization of, of, of natural animal dung and remains of foods to create gas for your cooking. So, so there are various ways, but it's, it's something technical that the country needs to sit down and analyze, which, which we have done previously when we were doing the Nigeria's energy transition plan. Hurricanes and cyclones characterized by strong wind and heavy rains. Extreme weather in sub-Saharan Africa include dust storms, strong dry winds, heat waves, and droughts. And finally, floods. Floods and heavy rains are phenomena in all parts of the world. In early 2000s, some climate research proving man's complicity in recent extreme conditions emerged. It is we on Earth that are causing climate change and driving it. So, man has something to do with carbon footprints because we exist on Earth and we uh, do a lot of activities and perform a lot of actions that tend towards emitting into the atmosphere. That is the direct connection of man with carbon footprints. From wildfires in the United States of America, heat waves in India, typhoons in Asia, and countries along the Mediterranean to extreme rainfall in Europe and Africa. Not forgetting droughts. So this is why you see climate change uh, is a collective effort and international communities are all coming together to provide supports and finances. Now, coming back to Nigeria, what we're gradually seeing is that the southern part of the country is increasingly becoming wetter and the semi-arid areas of the north are becoming drier. Consequently, we don't know the exact time, but if climate change persists, we're likely to be caught between the devil of drought and the deep blue sea of floods. We have seen the effects of floods. We've seen the damages in, and loss of lives and properties. We've also seen the effect of, of drought. I mean, it causes poverty, insecurity, and, and what have you. Hence, um, climate change will continue to pose significant threats in countries' environment and economy, especially in the areas of poverty food and eradicating food security. These bipolar weather events have made humans more conscious of the damage their way of life is inflicting on the environment. Over two million of my fellow Kenyans are facing climate-related starvation. Climate experts and environment enthusiasts have been at the forefront of this advocacy, calling for man to reduce his carbon footprints on Earth. If you are having emissions, you must also prepare your natural environment to be able to counter the emissions you are having. So while you have the emission and massive deforestation is taking place somewhere, then they don't add up. We have a situation whereby the government must do something to ensure that our natural vegetation is protected, managed sustainably. The way deforestation is taking place in Nigeria is not sustainable. 1.5 million trees fell every day. You know, we've lost kilometers of forest, gone. But we've lost more than 96% of Nigeria's entire forest cover. 
So it is dangerous. The desert is encroaching at 0.6% per annum. A carbon footprint is the total amount of greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide and methane, that are generated by human actions on the environment. Like, if you come to somebody's house, you find out that somebody is using a um, generator that is emitting a lot into the atmosphere it, uh, instead of using um, a renewable energy source, which is a solar panel to generate electricity. You know, all those activities are the major source of carbon footprint by individuals. And note that it is not only individual carbon footprint we are talking about here. It could be organizational carbon footprint or entity or industry. We must make sure that we, we live in harmony with nature. Prepare our natural environment to be able to cope with the emissions. As of the emissions, we have to legislate to stop the, the rascality that is taking place. If we are industrializing and our factories are emitting, this, that's a different ballgame. You are building your economy, you see how you can control that. But here, I don't see too much of industrialization taking place. And we have people who are burning crude oil somewhere, emitting people are importing cars, vehicles that are outdated. So government must do something to counter all these things. Research shows that the average carbon footprint for a person in the United States is 16 tons, seen as one of the highest rates in the world. On a global scale, experts say the average carbon footprint is four tons. To have the best chance of avoiding a two degree Celsius rise in global temperatures, the average global carbon footprint per year needs to drop below two tons by the year 2050. No consumption is part of it. Mm -hmm. So we have to be disciplined. Discipline yourself on what and what to consume. If you know you are consuming something that is uh, is not good to the environment, or if you know that even when you consume such uh, such a food or product and you don't handle the waste well, why consuming it? I will give you an instance. Waste management is a problem everywhere you go to, particularly in the FCT. In the capital territory, like where we are now, um, central area, you may not find the environment that, but go to satellite areas. All those suburb areas, go to Buari area council, go to Kubwa, go to Nyanya, all these areas around. You find out that it's very, very, very dirty. So people don't manage waste well. It's not only government that should be responsible for management of waste. Individuals, individuals should start from their home to manage waste. Clean up the environment, manage it well, proper disposal of waste. Don't put it inside data to block drainage system because all these things have a collective effect on flood in Nigeria. Taking into consideration some of the major contributors to carbon footprint, how can the world achieve below two tons global footprint before 2050? Let's just take a century ago. We didn't have the kind of massive flooding we have in Nigeria periodically. So what changed between then and now? Okay, we have built up our cities. Some of these cities are not well planned. You know, even when they seem to be well planned because buildings are arranged properly, you have destroyed, you have completely taken out nature out of it, which is not supposed to be. If you go to some developed countries, even right within the cities, you will see areas that have been left to balance up here, we don't have that. If you build your houses on every portion of land, and if it's where it comes, water will not have where to go to. You know, when you cut down trees, people don't know or tend to forget that trees absorb, absorb excess water. Not only do trees absorb water, they keep the water. And when there is need to release water, they also release. So the environment is always ready for whatever you want to do with it. When you take out trees from the environment, you are affecting even humans. Climate experts advocate the use of public transportation, such as buses and trains, which they say reduces an individual's carbon footprint when compared 
with driving personal cars. Individuals and corporations can also reduce their respective carbon footprint by installing energy efficient lighting or using renewable energy sources to generate electricity. Go back to your home, check all the things, all the activities you are performing in your house. Are you a kind that will not like local farming, vegetation around you? Are you a type that will always patronize fast food joints and always go to markets and, you know, and all those activities are part of the carbon footprint we are talking about? Are you a type that always likes to be driving yourself? You drive all the time. You don't like entering public transport. And you know public transport like buses and BRT buses such as in Lagos, it, it has gone, uh, it, it has come uh, you know, emission, vehicular emission in no small way because most people are now parking their cars at home. Sustainable living is, is what we can do. It will, it will help us reduce the damage of climate change and it will help us safeguard our health. Um, unfortunately, the effects of climate change are not immediate and rapid. So people do not really understand them. Taking clean cooking, for example, um, people cook with firewood because the smoke vanishes almost immediately. So you don't understand the damage or the amount of emissions you push on into the atmosphere. However, now cooking with, clean, uh, with, with dirty fuels, that affects you. You either develop cold, uh, cough, red eyes. So far, Africa accounts for only two to three percent of the world's carbon dioxide emission from energy and industrial sources. A study on energy and environment by Statista shows that Africa's average emission in 2021 was about one metric tons per capita, compared with the global figure of over four tons, with South Africa and Egypt producing the most emissions at the time of study. So, uh, how do we cope with it? How do we build the resilience? What we are saying from this part of the world is that we are not the primary cause or causes of climate change and we shouldn't be left to bear the brunt of climate change. If we have to manage it, it entails extra resources on the part of government to do so. These countries that are causing the, the, the rising temperatures through their emission should bring the resources to enable the poorer countries cope with the menace. I thank the Prime Minister of All the conference of the parties, so the COP, COP 26, 27, we are preparing for COP 28. We I was saying the polluters should pay. Bring the resources for us to manage to protect our environment, protect our forests, protect our ocean seas and cities, protect our villages. You know, when certain things happen, you see that the government cannot... When Yenegu and Nelly went on that through flood, the Western state government was almost helpless. This is what I'm calling on federal government now. Many other states, many other states, that's the way it is. So we need extra resources. The federal government should add its voice to the international call for support from industrialized nations to cope so I with climate you, change, mitigation what? and resilience building adaptation to climate change. We need resources to achieve that. What are some of the factors contributing to carbon footprint in Africa and Nigeria? How can it be reduced? To a layman, I will take a layman in the northern part of the country where it's usually hot. So I'll give that person an analogy of his daily life. Um, looking at years back, the country was a bit cooler. Now, the northern part of the country increasingly becomes drier and hotter. So I'd ask him, can you remember when there were trees here and there were shades that you can sit down? There was breeze everywhere. But now that you've utilized these trees, you've, you've fallen them down to cook. It, it's a dry land and, and it keeps becoming hotter and hotter. Why do you think so? I'm sure he doesn't know. So I would tell him it's because of you have removed the carbon sinks that are already there. Uh, basic photosynthesis. Uh, trees, they inhale or they take in carbon dioxide and, and exhale or bring out oxygen. So this gives you air. So I, I think that, that that would kind of bring him to the understanding where we want before we go into technicalities as um, climate change, which I'm sure they don't understand. So I would then go ahead to tell him that these changes of season, the hotter you see, the lesser rains, this is as a result of uh, 
uh, climate change anthropogenic activities, which are the 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 the, the, the dirty fuels you used to cook, the, the the trees you are falling to cook with them, and and different types of emissions. Reducing carbon footprint has been proven to aid in living a healthier lifestyle and saving money. Individuals should spend less in those activities that could generate uh, emissions into the atmosphere, then spend more on those activities that could you know, reduce the emission into the atmosphere, such as buying of solar energies, using uh, environmental friendly appliances in his or her house. It will go a long way. You, you can see that if you spend more on these solar panels or renewable energy, you will reduce the way you use fossil fuel in your house to generate energy and it is spending more. Then, on the other hand, if you spend less on those activities that would, you know, increase emission into the atmosphere. Whether it's for cleaner air, a healthier diet, or reduced energy bills, the benefits of reducing carbon footprint means everyone lends a hand in solving the global climate problem. There is always this tension between the environment and the economies. When you have industrialists operating, the main goal is maximization of profit. The environment becomes secondary. It is left for the authorities to ex exert control over them. For we as individuals, we should learn to imbibe the tenets of proper waste disposal systems, you know, aided by government. There are places where people are willing to dispose of their wealth in a more decent, civilized way. But the infrastructure is not in place to do that. Where the, what does it end up? So we should learn to put the necessary infrastructure in place to be able to manage waste. Recycling, there must be recycling plants for waste. We must see waste as wealth, yeah. as opportunity. Yeah, when it happens, it will be on road to pilots to drive because people are yeah. looking for the waste anyway. So you will see it there. You know, the situation whereby we don't reuse, we don't recycle, you will always, they will always, if you take them from one part, end up like this. You will not solve them. So let us learn what to do with our waste. Those that are biodegradable, you take them to where they serve as manure to, to renew the environment. Those that are not, you take them where they could be used or recycled and used as raw, mater or used as raw materials for production of some other thing. Environment activists have proposed some ways towards reducing personal carbon footprint. These include insulate your home and use less energy, switch to renewables and save on your energy bill, Buy energy efficient bulbs and appliances. Use less water. Change your diet. Reduce meat and dairy consumption. Turn off the lights when not in use. Go digital. Reduce use of printed documents. Cycle to work. Walk when you can. Reduce, reuse and recycle. Eliminate single-use plastic. Raise awareness. Compost. Set up compost schemes where you can. Switch off computers when not in use. Use local food. Locally processed food takes less energy to transport. Take local trips. Avoid trips by planes, trains and buses when you can. Use public transport. Reduce the number of petrol burning cars on the roads. Fly direct. Offset your carbon. Pack a water bottle. Think green. Whatever you do, leave as light a carbon footprint as possible. Experts say excessive lifestyle has had a negative influence on the environment so far, reiterating that now is the time for action. The, the, the main thing about climate change is adaptability. The climate will change whatever we do. Some damages have already been done. Is but how do we adapt to that? I would propose a circular economy, a circular way of living. Now, instead of uh, flared gas from the Niger Delta being piped to rural areas 
for them to buy at a rate that they may not be able to afford, which is which is now us spending a lot of money piping gas and now people not affording. It's a redundant asset. Why don't we build their capacities in, in, in developing biogas home systems? What a biogas home system is, is basically a drum, which you can take your normal drum, your normal rubber drum, and then you put in the cow dunk. If you're a farmer, predominantly 80% of this country's, uh, country, country men are farmers, men and women, uh, excuse me, they're farmers. So we take this cow dunk, you, you, you put it, let it be like a bit, uh, half of that drum, you put in water and you close it and you pipe it. It's, it's an easy, easy technology. Now, over time, it ferments when you put it in the sun. So that gas that comes out of it can be used for cooking. The same cooking, when you cook, when you finish eating the remains of your food, you, your food, you dump it inside that gas. So this is a circular economy way of living. Now, for, for, for rarest of animals, now, if you rear goats, if you rear cows, uh, one of the highest emitters is, 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 is livestock. This cow dung and, and, and goats and, ch and chicken dung, all of them emit some form of methane. Instead of leaving it on the ground, why don't you take it? As much as you would use some for your manure, utilize it for biogas. So this is you having clean cooking at zero cost. And it's a cyclic process because you never finish, you, you would never stop eating. You would always have remains. You would rear your cows, they would eat. They would always have cow dung. So, so this is a continuous gas for free. So this is what I would suggest for the population of Nigeria. And if government is to come in, I think government's intervention should be based on building people's capacity to be able to develop the simple technologies, but not subsidizing the energy systems. Sustainable Development Goal, SDG 12, calls for responsible consumption and production. It is one of the sustainable development goals established by the United Nations in 2015. It calls for good use of resources, improving energy efficiency, sustainable infrastructure, and providing access to basic services, green and decent jobs, as well as ensuring better quality of life. All these SDG goals from go 1 to 17, all of them has a link with climate change and addressing climate change. Go 13 is climate action. And everything, if, if each country should handle uh, um, the issue of SDG goals and achieve it, we have addressed climate change. Mm. But you know it's not easy. Mm. It's easier said than done. Yeah. Most countries will come and sign agreements, uh, ratify it locally, like Nigeria, we are signatories to so many of all these related climate change agreements, international agreements. You know, we have even localized most of them. And the implementers are the federal government through the Ministry of Environment. They are doing their best. Mm. But I am saying that individuals, whether collectively or um, by two governments, all hands must be on deck. The generation of our entire energy is also carbon intensive. So the lesser energy you utilize, the better for the climate. Now, when you're going out, if you switch up your appliances, that helps you in your bills and that also helps the emission. Some of these energy appliances have different radiations. Some of them have gases. It also goes into the atmosphere as well as affect you as a human being. So, so I think it supports your health and both the climate. If you try to live sustainably, use less energy uh, and also ensure importantly to utilize clean fuels when doing a lot of activities. We should take environmental education seriously, environmental awareness seriously. Government agencies, various spheres of government, NGOs, both local and international, we have work on our hands. We have to educate people. First of all, to understand their environment and let them know what their roles within the environment is. Experts say promoting green growth with the aid of government policy and reform can help tackle the lack of awareness about the need to be responsible in consumption and production.